Okay, let's begin. Uh, welcome everyone. I'm Walter Mead, the uh, Raven B. Curry Fellow here at Hudson Institute. And it's my great pleasure and privilege to be here today with uh, one of the most interesting voices in American foreign policy. And I can also say an old friend at this time, at least we're both old enough <laughs> to be old friends. Robert Kagan is the Stephen and Barbara Friedman Senior Fellow in the Foreign Policy Program at Brookings Institution. He's a contributing columnist to the Washington Post. He served in the State Department from 1984 to 1988 as a member of the policy planning staff, as principal speechwriter for F Secretary of State George Shultz, and as deputy for policy in the Bureau of Inter-American Affairs. He's a graduate of Yale University and Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government and holds a doctorate in American history from American University. And he's here today because he has written really a fascinating book. It's the second volume in a projected three-volume history of American foreign policy. I knew and very much liked the first volume, Dangerous Nation. I've taught it in class and found it uh, a great book for students to wrestle with. The second book, um, Just Out, is A Ghost at the Feast, which takes the story up to 1941. And Bob is going to talk about that today, but I would say that the promise of of Dangerous Nation has been more than fulfilled in this second volume. The story is getting richer and more interesting as we go toward the present day. So I thought the best thing to do would be to ask Bob to start off by just describing the book for us, telling us what it's about, what the, what the main points are you want to get across, whatever you think we need to hear. Okay. Well, how much time do you have? Could, you know, an uh, endless. Uh, uh, I'll, 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 try to, I'll try to hit the highlights. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me here. Uh, it's great to be talking to Walter. We already had a 15-minute argument before we got on stage. Yeah. I think Walter and I could probably hash out things in American history for until the cows come home, and, and happily so. So thank you very much, and thank you to the Hudson Institute uh, for hosting this. Um, as Walter said, the, 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 it's volume two of a, of a multi-volume history of American foreign policy, and it begins in 1900 with uh, the, the, the dramatic events. Really, it begins in 1898 uh, with the Spanish-American War and the intervention in Cuba. Um, the book, in general, is about how Americans have, uh, in that period, dealt with the fact that thanks to a, a sort of radical reconfiguration of power in the international system, prim primarily uh, the, the sort of collapse of the British-dominated order that Walter has written about, um, the rise of Germany and Japan, uh, and the rise of the United States. Uh, basically, World War I was the sort of critical turning point that, that made clear what was happening, but it was already happening before World War I. Uh, and basically what had happened was the United States until 1900 was, in the words of, uh, of uh, you know, that great British ambassador who wrote the, the Commonwealth, James Bryce, mm -hmm. was sailing on a summer sea. The United States, Americans were the beneficiaries of a fundamentally liberal world system without having to do anything to support it. It was an entire, they were, we were, the Americans were the ultimate free riders and the greatest beneficiaries of this international yeah. system. Um, but then it collapsed, and Americans were left with, with a choice. And the choice was do something to restore it, to, to protect it, to fight back against those forces, particularly Germany uh, in World War I, that were opposed to it, or snuggle into the North American continent and, and, and enjoy your invulnerability. Because that was, this is sort of the key the key paradox of American foreign policy is that certainly by 1900, and I think fundamentally ever since, and this is something I think Americans are not quite aware of as much as they should be, the United States is invulnerable to foreign invasion. Um, we can talk about nuclear weapons and what that effect is, but certainly in 1900, before there were nuclear weapons, the United States was completely invulnerable. So nothing that happened out there in the world necessarily affected American security directly. And so when Americans acted, it was not out of necessity. It was out of choice. 
Um, in my view, it was the right choice, and I think I could make a case why it was a, an important choice. But, it, but as we define national interest historically as being fundamentally about security of the homeland in the first instance and security of the economic well-being of the nation in the second instance, those things were not threatened when America went to war. And this has led to all kinds of confusion about why Americans do what they do. And Americans talk a lot about, as I mentioned before, they talk about wars of necessity and wars of choice. But for Americans, it's always a war of choice. Uh, even World War, even our involvement in World War II was a, was a war of choice. And we can argue about that or get into that if you feel like it. Uh, the point being that ultimately, Americans in both of those wars decided, as a matter of choice, that they didn't want to live in a world where, uh, where autocratic, militaristic regimes dominated in Europe and Asia. Uh, they wanted to maintain, to establish and maintain a liberal hegemony in the world. Not necessarily an American hegemony. Americans didn't want to control Europe. They didn't want to control Asia. But they wanted to make sure that the liberal way of life was both surviving and even predominant, uh, first in Europe and then uh, ultimately in Asia. And it's that uh, ultimately ideological motivation, in my view, uh, that drove the United States into both wars. And I think if we want to jump ahead to the present circumstance, mm. also explains our, our current policies in Ukraine. Because it's, again, no one, even though Mitch McConnell says that Ukraine is a vital national security interest of the United States, to say that is to assume a lot of other things above all that it's critical to this liberal world system that Americans uh, have created over the course of the period that I'm writing about in the book. So uh, I'll, I'll stop there. That's a sort of a general thesis. But um, one of the things that I did in, in writing this book, and I'll end with this note, is I didn't go back and try to confirm all the things that I believed about American foreign policy. I really tried to research and write it going forward, to try to see things as, you know, we live history forwards we judge history backwards. Mm. And our judgments are generally fairly uh, arrogant uh, based on the fact that we know how things turned out. But at the time, you don't know how things are going to turn out. And the fact is, as we move forward, as we make history, as we take actions, we don't know where they're going to end. Uh, and we have to understand the mindset of the people at the time and why they did what they did, rather than always come back and say, you idiots, you fools. Uh, those people were us. They're not different from us. And they face the same kinds of choices that we face every day. And they made the mistakes that we are probably also going to make um, because there's very little learning about in, in, in the world when it comes to these things. But anyway, that, that was my goal in the book, to write a history forward and take it wherever it went. And then that is, I think, a really important idea to keep in mind that we that we live history forward and judge it backward, that um, uh, people in the past spent as much time thinking about their circumstances as we spend thinking about ours, and brought all the subtlety and knowledge, which we can't actually reproduce, because we can never quite know the past as well as the people in the past, because this is something we're just doing for a few hours a day. It was their life. Um, and this notion, too, that we perceive the past as moving most of the time kind of inevitably towards certain outcomes, but no one experiences their own time in quite that way. Um, and the other thing that, that I hear in that that I think is just so profound and important is that one of the great lessons of history is that people don't actually learn very much from history, or at least not very easily. Um, if you would like, we will try to have some time for Q&A at the end of this. If you have some questions, please feel free to email them to press at hudson.org, and that would include our friends that are um, watching the live stream. And then uh, uh, I'll get a list of questions and be able to, to follow up on that. So press at hudson.org.
That also gives you an excuse you can play with your cell phone now and pretend <laughs> that this is actually, you're being engaged in what's going on. Uh, all right. Um, I thought, by the way, I, I want to start by saying, I think one of the best parts of the book is the um, analysis of Wilson's thinking and the American politics pending our entry into World War I. This is, again, it's a case where everyone thinks they already know everything about Woodrow Wilson that they need to know, and there's, there's a lot of kind of myth-making and, and sort of assumptions behind it. But you really show somebody kind of torn by various conflicting forces and dilemmas. So why did Wilson bring the U.S. into World War I, in your view? Well, it, it, one of the things that I would say as a general historical matter is that we place, I would say, too much weight on the role of individual presidents in setting foreign policy as if a president can come in and completely shift the direction of American foreign policy all by himself, whether the people are there or not. And, and Wilson, who has probably of any of our 20th century presidents, maybe of any, of any president of any time, has the reputation for being aloof, uninterested in advice, disconnected, he, he, arrogant, living in his own mind, and coming up with these wild idealistic ideas. And, and while I would not defend Wilson's uh, personality, I, I don't think I'd like to spend a lot of time in the room <laughs> with Woodrow Wilson, unless he was like your best buddy, I think maybe he'd be let down. Then you could hear some off-color racist jokes, you know, from him. But, but, as, a, but as a politician, um, it's worth remembering, first of all, that he was a very successful president yeah. uh, up until the League of Nations and the Versailles Treaty vote. Uh, in, he, he managed to pass all kinds of major reform legislation as president. And when he, you'll be, not be shocked to hear, enjoyed a Democratic majority in Congress, he pretty much controlled what Congress did um, and, and, and kept things the way he wanted. He's also the only two-term Democratic president between Andrew Jackson and Franklin Roosevelt. Two right. Six, uh, this is an amazing feat. Right. It was a, Repub it was a Republican-dominated era. He only won in, two, in 1912 because of, Frank, of Teddy Roosevelt's egomania and running as a third-party candidate. And as it was, Wilson won something like 40 percent of the vote. Uh, in a three in a three way race, and but he won legitimately and quite brilliantly in 1916, and manipulated the war issue among other things. As you know, he was the president who kept us out of war, and he meant that. But even though he knew he probably was not going to continue to be able to keep them out of war, anyway, all of this is a long way of saying that Wilson was like other presidents in the sense that. He didn't want to get out in front of the American people. He felt that he had an obligation to do what the American people, what he felt they wanted him to do. And in his own way, he was a better reader of the American public attitudes than, for instance, at the same time, people like Theodore Roosevelt and Henry Cabot Lodge. So for instance, after the sinking of the Lusitania, uh, there were many people of a certain type from the Elihu Roots to the Theodore Roosevelt's to the Henry Cabot Lodges who said, we've got to go to war. They just sunk the Lusitania. It was a horrible thing. Let's go to war. And people, would, people said then and even later that if Wilson had led the American people at that time to go to war, the American people were, were ready to respond. Uh, and the, the truth is Wilson, A, did not think that that was true. And I, as far as I'm able to, dis, to figure out what the public mood was, he was right that that wasn't true that the American people were not ready to go to war after the Lusitania, even though Lusitania had a fundamental effect on their attitudes towards Germany, which would later become uh, an issue. And so what I see Wilson trying to do is what all presidents try to do, which is solve a, the intersection of a, of a set of domestic attitudes and an international foreign policy crisis that did need to be settled. Uh, and so... Uh, and that, that played out most, uh, obviously, uh, dramatically in the great clashes over the League of Nations Treaty. Leading the American people to war in 1917 was not a difficult thing to do. By the time he was ready to go to war, the American people were more than ready to go to war. And he enjoyed overwhelming support. There was some very vocal dissent, but the overwhelming 
uh, majority of the country was entirely and things that events had conspired to make that uh, to make that a, a plausible option, and he went with it. Uh, but when he came back after the end of the war and said, okay, now it's time for us to really put our shoulder and join, join the international community as a permanent basis, then we had the great debate with Henry Cabot Lodge and the Republicans, et cetera, which was ultimately a political fight, which Wilson lost. But why did Wilson lose it? Because he'd lost control of Congress. Congress flipped in 1918 and became a majority Republican Congress. And if you look at the history of treaty making up until that time, the opposition party in Congress always voted against whatever treaty <laughs> the president was putting forth. Uh, they, the, the Congress had defeated uh, William Howard Taft's, um, uh, what do they call those, the, the uh, arbitration. arbitration agreement with Great Britain, which was like the simplest, easiest, least offensive uh, and Lodge did exactly to Taft what he would later do to Wilson, which was put so many amendments on it that it basically became the opposite of what it was intended to do, uh, and Taft had to withdraw the treaty altogether. His treaty, he withdrew. So uh, what Wilson faced was long odds to begin with, um, and then Lodge's willingness to abandon his own internationalism in the interest of defeating the treaty in order to defeat the Democrats and get the Republicans back in the White House in 1920. So you can blame Wilson for all kinds of things, but that was the world he lived in. And I think he, you know, until he got very ill and, ha you know, ha when he made his speaking tour uh, in 1919 and then, you know, had a stroke, until then, he was doing about as best as he could do, and I don't blame him. As you off, as you, there were 15 reasons why people blame Wilson for the defeat of the League and the treaty, but I really think he did about as best as he could do. Mm -hmm. um, and yet it didn't work. And yet it didn't work, and, and the why it didn't work is an interesting question, because either you could say the American people were never going to buy into that idea of of being sort of on call at all times in defense of the liberal world order. Um, but, but I think it's not clear that they couldn't have, because when he first came back from Paris, the polls, insofar as there were no polls then, but insofar as public opinion could be measured, everyone agreed, Wilson and Lodge, uh, that the treaty had overwhelming support. And Lodge's control of the Senate, he was both Senate Majority Leader and Senate Foreign Relations Committee Chairman allowed him to drag out the, the treaty discussion and bring up every conceivable objection and every ethnic group in America that it was upset because Ireland got screwed or because Italy got screwed or one of those. And he was able brilliantly to, to get the Republican Party, which was a majority in favor of the League to start, ultimately to turn against right. it. And again, purely for political reasons, not as a, not as a foreign policy argument. Um, uh, I don't think today we'll be shocked to know that sometimes politicians flip their views uh, on major policy issues for political reasons, and that's exactly what happened here. What I find uh, impressive is how American historians just refuse to see that yeah. and insist on treating this because they're, in I mean, historians are intellectuals, so they have the problems that intellectuals have. So they want to see this as a great conflict between Wilson's vision of the world and Lodge's vision of the world. And the truth is there was very little difference between their visions of the world. What made them different was that Wilson was a Democratic president and Lodge was a Republican leader with the majority in the Senate. You know, one theme in the book that, that keeps coming up over and over is your sense that most American historians are not very good. <laughs> and that the sort of intellectual level in the United States, both of American political history and maybe especially of American foreign policy history, is kind of low. And you can see you don't always attack people by name, but there are a lot of people whose theories of history you go after in this book. I would say that, that Henry Kissinger's sort of effort to organize a kind of a Wilsonian idealism versus Rooseveltian, Theodore Rooseveltian realism is one of those targets. Yeah. You really go for that. Yeah. And, of course, you know, Kissinger didn't invent that. That became a kind of mantra in the 
what I, what I discovered, by the way, is that as is often the case, so you had the events and then you had the political reaction to the events and then the political reaction to the events led to an intellectual reaction to the events. So uh, the events being World War I and the League and the Versailles Treaty, uh, which were then defeated politically and in the process of defeating them politically, where they were defeated intellectually uh, as being everything was wrong. And that became the standard uh, sort of narrative of this period, Wilson's excess, Wilson's excessive idealism, Roosevelt's hardcore realism, Lodge's realism, et cetera. Uh, that, was the, that was the argument of the winners, which then became the argument of historians. Until and, 20 years later when it sort of flipped. Well, and then it flipped briefly, but we have somehow come back to that. Then, then there's the whole economic explanation of oh, everything problem. This is right. Your, your attack on the open door without actually yeah. mentioning certain historical it's names. In, they're in the footnotes to some extent, yeah. but yeah. Right. yeah. Um, no, and that's the other thing, and this is particularly notable in, when you look at the, the American intervention in Cuba in 1898. What was the cause of that intervention? And I, I think it's abundantly clear that it was the cause was humanitarianism, not economic imperialism. And for proof of that, I would only point to the fact that one of the most enthusiastic supporters of the intervention in Cuba uh, was Mark Twain. Mark Twain, I think, epitomized the anti-imperialist view of that time, which was the intervention in Cuba was good. The intervention in the Philippines and the ultimate acquisition of the Philippines was, was bad. bad. And that was the imperialism that was bad. And, and that was the standard account for 20 years afterwards, that the intervention in Cuba was a good thing, the, the seizure of the Philippines was a bad thing, to the point where even Robert La Follette, the ultimate progressive uh, defining the left wing of, of American politics other than socialism, uh, even in the 20s was still talking about how the intervention in Cuba was about granting freedom to others. So, but if you, I, I would say, I would just say that everyone in this room in high school or college learned that the entire event was an economic, was driven by economic imperialism. Um, despite the fact that most historians have actually debunked that, and yet it, it survives even in the highest quality textbooks. Um, and so, you know, one of the, it's kind of interesting to trace how a current set of received wisdom, when did it get to be received wisdom, and why did it get to be yep. received wisdom? And one of the reasons, I'm sorry, maybe it's getting into the weeds here, but one of the reasons the views on Cuba and the intervention changed was that the whole revulsion against American activism in foreign policy following World War I led to revisionist accounts, which then were fed into by you know, Charles Beard writes his famous book in 1913, I think it is, on the, you know, the economic causes of, the, concept, of the, constitu the economic origins of the Constitution, and then economics is now everything. And so between the sort of quasi-isolationist rejection of American involvement overseas as being fundamentally evil, uh, and add to it then, and the motive for that intervention we are now deciding is always economic, and to some extent, that is still the dominant view of American foreign policy and all these periods that we're talking about today. Um, and so in that sense, I guess my book is an attempt at, at revisionism. Um, I, I didn't make it a kind of overt, as you say, it's not an overt revisionism, but if anybody bothers to read it, they will see that a lot of things that they thought about what was true about American foreign policy in various different periods was not necessarily the case. As, as I was thinking about this, um, reading it, it struck me that, um, that maybe in a democracy it's sort of inevitable that history gets turned into kind of, you know, like little political legends so that you can say, oh, that's Munich again, yeah, right. or oh, that's Holy Smoot, or oh, that's Iraq, whatever it may right, be. Right. And, that, you know, and, and that history in some academic history uh, which is read by very few people, uh, 
uh, is, is maybe at one level, but the popular history that we all carry around in our heads of what happened is mostly a tissue of lies, <laughs> fabrications, um, or just deliberately distorted views, which may account for the reason that, that American foreign policy debates so often don't seem to be that consequential or thoughtful. Well, you know, there is, a, there is a theme to all of the mythology, and it, it, the mythology is basically almost any time that we've acted in the world, the, our, uh, both our motives and the consequences have been terrible. Um, and, you know, when I read about how, uh, you know, the people write about how the last 30 years have been a disaster in American foreign policy, I have to say, after studying these particular 40 years, the last 30 years seem like a dream. Um, now give us another 10, you would know, be my worry. My, my, question, my question is always, if you didn't like this 30 years, which 30 years did you like? You know, did you like the 30 years right. between 1900 and 1930, the 30 years between 1930 and 1960? Right. I mean, um, yeah. we, we, we'd have a, one of the consequences of our cartoonish approach to our history is that Everything looks settled and obvious. Yep. And we, we, got the, we were talking about this at the beginning, but you know, that we, we think we, we know what happened, and, and it's a nice, simple story. And then when we're faced with the unbelievable complexity of our current situation, we, we, wanna, we reach back for these simplistic explanations, and they take us nowhere. Because they don't take us, and this is my ultimate you know, goal in life, as I'm sure it's sort of Walter's to some extent goal in life too, they don't take us to an actual explanation as to why Americans do what they do. There are a lot of mythological explanations, most of which have to do with naming various baddies who got us into this and who got us right. into that. I mean, that, that the Cuban, that the American intervention in Cuba is regarded as a plot that was foisted on us by Theodore Roosevelt and Henry Cabot Lodge is to completely misunderstand what happened in that period, where, in fact, it was the left, if anything, but that the popularity of the intervention in Cuba was so overwhelming that to attribute it to one or two people is sort of absurd, but it is a way that Americans have of letting themselves off the hook for their actions, this whole concept that there are there are elites and a few people who are pulling the strings behind in right, a democracy right. where vo votes are where, the, where wars are voted on, where polls are taken, where congressmen run on whether they supported the war or not, and yet somehow it's all the machinations of a couple of a couple of people. This is a constant theme, and and a lot of the mythology of American right. history is about it is about finding the nefarious causes of actions which at the time seemed completely obvious uh, and the right thing to do. Right. I think one of the interesting things, people used to talk about the Vietnam syndrome, but one of the costs of, of wars that in retrospect people are not that excited by is it often creates a generation of bad foreign policy thinking. <laughs> because what people do is they say with the Vietnam War, they say, well, obviously, it was a, you know, really was horrible. We don't want to go back and do that again. And so you, the desperate need to find out, okay, what were the, quote, mistakes? No. Um, who made them? And then you want to develop a set of rules from this so that if we never do this again, we will never have one of those again. Right, right. And to convert, and foreign policy, <coughs> I think, ultimately is an art, it's not a science, and it's a very inexact art. It's much more like a competitive athletic event where each side makes mistakes, commits fouls, uh, may, you know, the best player in the world can lose to the worst player on a given day, all of these kinds of things. But we want to impose a rationality on this process because it's so terrifying what happens when it goes wrong. Well, exactly. And the sport that I always compare foreign policy to is baseball. Baseball is a sport where if you fail 70% of the time, you go to the Hall of Fame. Right. And, and I think foreign policy needs to be understood that way. It is just as hard as baseball um, to get foreign policy <laughs> even right. Even harder, perhaps. Maybe even harder. And, and so this sort of demand that we have for perfect, uh, not even perfect, but even 
I, I admit that you know Iraq and Afghanistan is not a perfect outcome, but even for the sort of uh, you know bad but not horrible outcomes that occur in foreign policy. I mean, if you think of how many times the British Empire had its Iraqs and Afghanistans over the course of its empire, um, without shaking the fundamental. By the way, I'm not a fan of the British Empire, but it, it didn't shake Britain's fundamental feeling that they still had this, this, this task to, to maintain the empire. Um, and, and what you say is right, and the only thing I would add to it is that what happens in a situation like Vietnam is we don't just go back and say, which little tactical errors did we make? We go back and say, it was our entire philosophy right, right. of foreign policy that It was, was a moral evil that got us well, into this. Well, you know, it's like you, uh, you watch the trajectory of a David Halberstam, for instance, on the question of Vietnam. Halberstam, who was a full-throated supporter of the war, uh, even in, as late as 1965, was saying Vietnam was a vital interest of the United States, very Mitch McConnell at that time. Then when the war goes bad, uh, Halberstam turns against it, but importantly, not only against the war, but against the entire containment strategy. All of a sudden, Dean Acheson goes from being a fairly revered figure on the liberal right. side of the spectrum to being one of the baddies, because somehow, and, it, and they're not wrong, did containment get us into Vietnam? Yes, the theory right. of containment got us into Vietnam. Do you then get rid of the theory of containment, or do you make sure that the theory of containment doesn't lead you to right. another Vietnam? And well, that's the problem we've had with Iraq, too, which is, it's exactly what you say, Walter. I always want to say, okay, let's, Iraq was a terrible idea. What are the things that we, sh what, what do we have, to, what is the doctrine that keeps us from having the next Iraq? And that's not as easy to come up with as, right. as you think. You no, could say there is none, I would say. Well, we'll never intervene overseas. That is a yeah, doctrine right. that will keep us out of Iraq. And by the way, that, is, that was the doctrine of, the, of almost half the country in the 1930s, right? right? Was we just are not going to get involved out there. Because to get involved out there is to be pulled into this whole uh, disaster. And they thought World War I was a disaster, which it wasn't really. Um, so. But then you get this sort of, well, therefore, we shouldn't be, to some extent, the Iraq effect, like the Vietnam right. effect, is that we shouldn't be you know, involved anywhere. And that doesn't work either. So, Well, the other thing that I think is, is interesting is, and, and you touch on this, that so much of the revisionism of the 20s and 30s was caused by people who had been really emotionally invested yeah. in World War I as the war to save democracy, et cetera, et cetera. And then afterwards, when those emotions had subsided and the world looks different, and we didn't actually build a shining city on a hill, but sort of the same old mess more or less continued, then there's a kind of revulsion from those emotions. Right. And you get an equally emotional judgment of that period right. from there. And it, and it's, and it, it is usually uh, American liberals who go through this because yeah. Uh, as in World War I, and dare I say, as in Vietnam, and dare I say, as in Iraq, you start with tremendous liberal support because, for, for reasons I think are obvious, you know, it, is a, it does seem to be a fundamentally ideological conflict. It, uh, it's about world order to some extent. That's what liberals care about. So they wind up being, you know, great enthusiasts for these interventions. And then when the interventions turn, and as I say, you could say Iraq was very disillusioning. I don't think World War I was that disillusioning. We did win, <laughs> you know. Um, but when they turn against it, they turn against it times 10 because right. they're also feeling guilty uh, for the fact that they supported it initially. Um, liberals in, in World War I in particular felt uh, guilty and, and, took, and then became, if you watch... Watching the trajectory of intellectuals over a period Say of time. Reinhold Niebuhr is a good a, example. The Reinhold Niebuhrs, the Walter Lippmanns, who yep. were 100%, 110% in favor of the war. Lippmann was basically the cheerleader for World War I. And then, disillusioned, Lippmann becomes a realist. He ultimately votes against Roosevelt. He goes so far to the right that he finds Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt intolerable, and he doesn't vote for him. Reinhold Niebuhr uh, goes through, he's a realist, he's a communist, he, he tries everything. He's anything. a pacifist, but everything, until the 1930s roll around, the fascist regimes start rising, and then all of a sudden the liberals have now, they come back home, 
and they're all about World War, and they're all ready to go intervene in Europe uh, long before the rest of the country is. Right, right. World War II was a successful war, so we didn't have to repudiate our support for it. Um, it's the only war, I think, in history right. that liberals did not have to repudiate their support right. for. But then, and this will get into your next volume, liberals were not that enthusiastic about the Cold War uh, in the beginning. In the sort of 45 to 48 period. In the 45 moving. to 48 period, they thought they wanted, right, they were in a w one world, let's work with the Russians, yeah, yeah. et cetera. Sure, right. 46, I think, is probably what most people think of as the turning point for Atchison and company, anyway. For Atchison, but I'm thinking of, like, Eleanor Roosevelt. Sure, is, sure, sure, right. You know. That lasts a little longer with her, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's because, and this gets back to the period that the book is about, which is, um, you know, the country was politically divided over what to do about the, the state of the world. It wasn't just that they were divided over whether to intervene or not. Uh, conservative Republicans were pro, were comparatively speaking, soft on Hitler, soft on Mussolini. They thought the Soviet, they thought communism was the big threat at home. They accused Roosevelt of wanting to bring communism to the United States. That was a constant talking point. And therefore, as they looked out on the world, the number one enemy was the Soviet Union, not Hitler, who, after all, positioned himself as a bulwark against the Soviet Union. On the liberal democratic Roosevelt side, needs to say, what they were worried about domestically was fascism. Uh, you know, Sinclair Lewis was writing books about how fascism could come to here. And so their number one concerns are obviously Hitler and Mussolini, and a potential ally against Hitler and Mussolini is the Soviet Union. Right. So they're soft on the Soviets in this period. I mean, and, and look, at, look at our situation today. You can't tell me that a lot of the conservative opposition to aiding Ukraine isn't about their generally positive views of Putin and their generally negative views of the liberals who are opposed to Putin. That's probably the stronger one. Stronger, as always. But, but um, you know, whereas, not surprisingly, those who are liberal Democrats tend to be more supportive of doing something in Ukraine anti-Putin. Right. See, Putin is the Trump of Russia, and in a sense. Exactly. And, right. In the same way that, uh, you know, that there were actual, you know, right. Charles Lindbergh was pretty soft on the Germans, I'd have to say. Right. And thought that Franklin Roosevelt was kind of too close to Stalin. And, you know. Actually, what he thought was he was too close to the Jews. Right. Well... <laughs> Same in, in, in his mind. In his mind, right. <laughs> right. I want to ask one more question for myself, and then we'll go to some, some questions that have come in. And this is something I think I wish you'd, you'd done a bit more of in the book, and I'd like to kind of pull it out a bit, because it does seem to me that a key factor in the liberal evolution toward Britain and France um, and disillusion with World War I is that immediately after the war, France and Britain, they, you know, they become very imperialist in their behavior. And, you know, they're carving up the Middle East, the French are bombing Iraq, the British are bombing Iraq, the French are driving the noble Arab chieftains out of Damascus, and you have the Amritsar massacre in India. Um, it's, to me, as I look at the 20s in America, the strength of anti-colonial sentiment among liberals, which is partly brought in by missionaries who are in China, where they see the, 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 the British, in particular British colonialism, they see it as hopeless. They look at Asia and they say, you cannot hold on here. It's impossible. And they're right. Um, and yet the British are coming at Asia with all the sort of racial and dictatorial thing. And the British will frankly say, and they're still saying this in the 40s, that without the empire, we can't maintain our global position and our, and our living standards at home. So that liberal, the liberal perception of the British empire as a predatory organization and, and that an alliance with Britain is not about creating a liberal order. Um, is something, I think, that, that really shapes their thinking. Then in the 30s, Britain emerges as, well, they still don't think it's liberal, but they think it's better than, you know, it's, it's the greater, it's, Germany is a greater danger. And during World War II, Americans and the left is, you know, some of them Soviet agents, Harry Dexter White and so on, are systematically using the war to destroy the British Empire as they go through it. And I wish that that theme had, 
I think it would cast some light on some of what you're talking about. How would you well, respond to that? You know, it wasn't even just liberals. Um, base, and yeah. The argument, if you were opposing uh, Versailles uh, and the League, and after that, any involvement in Europe, which, right. uh, you know, that was the argument to hand, you know, that, right. they were, that they were colonials. When we entered the war in 1917, the, the William Boras of this world, who later were the king of the British, right. they, they somehow were not troubled at that moment by right. British colonialism. And that was not even used as an argument against intervening. So that, I, I can't tell how sincere right. it, it is. It probably was before the immediate, sev- you know, I think early in the war you would hear it. No, in the, in the war you would hear it. And when Wilson himself was opposing, was trying to stay out of the war, he said the only, it's just, the quote is something like, Britain has the world and Germany wants it. That, that yeah, was yeah. his summary of, uh, of the war. Now, at other times when he wanted to get into the war, he said this is a fight between autocratic militarism yeah, 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 yeah. on the one hand and democracy on the other, which I think is what he actually believed, by the way, because mm-hmm, I don't think mm-hmm. he was too troubled. I, by right, British, I think he, he, had a, he had a color-coded view of world politics. <laughs> well, in any case, but, but interestingly, and the only thing I want to add to what you say is the people who were making the loudest uh, complaints about helping the British Empire were Lodge uh, was Lodge when he was opposing the treaty because right. he the treaty was seen as being nice to Europe and nice to Britain so you had to uh, nice to France so you had to uh, turn that right. around and he he's also from a state with a large Irish vote and well, we which shouldn't was always forget that 1919 and 1920 are periods of literal war in Ireland. Well, 1916 is the Easter Uprising, right, right. and that is a period of, uh, that is probably the low point of American opinion about Britain. In fact, Americans were much more likely to be hostile to Britain because of their treatment of Ireland than they right. were because of their treatment of India, which most it, Americans didn't right, care that, about. Again, after 1920, that starts to change. Well, again, we're, we're already, we're, at that point, we're in such anti-Europe right. mode that we'll use whatever argument there is. So the, the yeah. only, that's the only thing I'm saying is I don't know how deep that right. feeling ran. I, but you know what? Um, in the review of my book in the New York Times, the guy repeats, the, the reviewer repeats that and, and says, how could you look at the, the, the order that the United States could have created in World War I, which would have included the British Empire and the French Empire. Mm-hmm. And that, therefore, it would have been, and I thought, my God, I haven't, I haven't read that argument since 1919. <laughs> but um, yeah, there it was. But there it was, you know. So that's definitely in there. It's just it seems to be mobile, though, Walter. I mean, then, then you know, well, I think in 1941, overwhelming majority of Americans is helping Britain. Well, now, I mean, right, they hate Hitler more. But right, <laughs> right. You know, I mean, I think that is, right. is also about, right. you know, perceptions of threat. In the absence of a threat perception, Britain looks ugly. In the presence of a threat perception, it starts looking less unattractive. Well, the, the, uh, the question is, I think that's right. And I think the question is, what is the, uh, what is the question that you're asking? So, for, like, so when Walter Lippmann is making the case for intervening in World War I, he doesn't put it as, we should help the British. He says, right. we need to defend the Atlantic community. Right. By which he means, in fairness, a fairly liberal system. If you look at the literals on the on the on the Atlantic on the American Atlantic coast and the literals on the European Atlantic coast, you have mostly liberal right. governments uh, in the Low Countries, Britain, France, etc. And that is what Lippmann called the Atlantic community, which was another way of saying the liberal world order of the time. Yeah, I think it's also, and you were writing a history of American foreign policy, but I think we should give a little bit more, in a sense, we should, we should ask ourselves why the British were so bad at communicating or you know, strategic communications with Americans. Were they? I think they actually were. I mean, I'm thinking of a post-World War II, but there were a lot of examples before. When they're broke and, and need American help, they send Keynes over who's probably the guy least likely to make friends in Congress in the well, whole... Well, you're, you're talking the World War II period. Right, but yeah, I'm right, saying, but even right. then, right. you know, there's sort of... Um, the Amritsar massacre was probably not the best move in 1920. Well, I don't think they made it as a move. No, but, <laughs> right, but you know what I mean. There yeah. was, but, yeah. but the idea of trying to think, okay, we really need the Americans on board. How do we craft our policies... 
you know, how do we steer this? I think that we're still in the habit of command. I just don't know. I mean, the only way I, I, would, I would refute that, in the, I would push back against that mm -hmm. in the following way. They handled the Americans pretty well when they were trying to get the Americans into the war. Took them longer than they wanted. The Americans, as, as Churchill rightly said, it would have been great if the Americans had come in earlier. Right. But can you blame them for not coming in earlier? The Brits themselves didn't want to go into World War I, and right. they were 20 miles from the continent. Right. We were 3,000 miles from the no. continent. I don't, think, I don't think you can blame America for not coming in sooner. Because for one thing, we'd never gone to Europe at all before then, you know? Right. So an Another thing, by the way, and, and this is something that I think we sometimes forget. Think about the debate over U.S. entry into World War I. Everyone is watching the trench warfare. Yeah. The, the real thing, the, the, the discussion in the United States is, are you going to send your son into that meat grinder? Right. Because there was no shortage of accounts about what it was like, no lack of information about casualty numbers. This was an extraordinary decision for a political community to take. That's right. And yet, when, when Wilson announces uh, in his war declaration of 1917 that he's going to raise an army of 500,000 and then another 500,000 after that, it's standing ovation in Congress, yep. you yep. know? And it's, 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 worth <laughs> it's worth remembering that. And, uh, but yes, it, it, it should never be surprising that Americans didn't get into the war. It, 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 what is interesting is that they did get into the war. And the British, all I would say is, the British, because this was a case where the similarities of cultures really mattered. Because when the war started and America was neutral, the question was going to be, can you get the goods and the money that you need from the Americans? The Germans were completely indifferent to the question. Um, they had a substantial trade with the United States, but they did not pay any attention to it whatsoever because right. in their minds it was all about the Schlieffen plan. They didn't even think the British were going to enter the war and who cared about the United States. So they had no plan. The, but because the Americans and the British financial communities were so tightly intertwined before the war yep. that when it, came out to when it came to working out the terms of neutrality, it was smooth. You know, their bankers met with our bankers. Their government officials now you're met with our like government officials. Like a Nye Commission witness. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 right. And that's why the Nye. Of course, the Nye Commission was not, you know, completely wrong in in right, in right. assessing how it was the United States wound up going to war. Exactly. It wasn't even completely wrong to say that yes, the money we were making selling to the Europeans sent the United States economy into one of the greatest growth periods in history. And yes, Wilson didn't feel like ending that and having a recession instead. Yes. You know? So it wasn't that the American economy actually depended on on trade, but but Wilson's election depended on trade. <laughs> and yeah. so, you know, those are the those are the kinds of things that we tend to miss. That's the politics exactly right. of it all. Well let me let me go to some audience questions. And unlike an old stick in the mud historian like me, the audience is actually interested in current events. Ah, so okay. Okay. um you mention in your book that FDR was worried that if Japan attacked Britain and the Europeans but left the U.S. alone, it would be hard to rally American public opinion for a war with Japan. Today, there's a lot of public support for arming the Ukrainians but not for sending in U.S. troops. Is there a similar dynamic today, and what about if China attacks Taiwan? Well, yeah, those are the questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even have to write a book to have to address those questions. But um, uh, I, I am right now very unsure about where Ameri the American public is exactly right now. Now, what they look like on what it looks like on paper is that we're very much in a kind of late 1940, early 1941 mode where we are the American people are very much taken sides. We know which side, the majority at least, have taken the sides. We know which side we're on, and we want to help the, the poor guys uh, win. But we definitely don't want to go to war. Our president is assuring us we're not going to go to war, et cetera, be the et cetera. arsenal of democracy. Right. And if you look at Franklin Roosevelt's speeches, even in his electoral campaign of 1940, at the very end of his campaign, he says, I am not. There will be no American boys sent to fight in foreign wars, period. 1940, you know, election time, 1940. Um, and that's where we are now. And yet we saw how easily uh, 
that slipped into something else, and how quickly Americans moved from, we want to arm them, but by no means go to war, right. to we want to arm them even at the risk of potentially winding up at war. Now, I don't know that that's where the American people think they are right and now. And there are no Russian submarines on the there high no seas sh sinking our ships. Right, and we are not, although, I mean, the interesting thing is, one of the reasons that we don't face this question is because we are so much more powerful. F for Putin, the last thing in the world he wants is to get us into the war. That's a disaster for him. He's losing to Ukraine. So he doesn't want NATO and the United States in the war. So in a way, we're being spared the difficulty. And of course, Roosevelt, during the, this same period, was deliberately pushing against Hitler in the Atlantic in the hopes of ultimately, whether he consciously meant it or not, it's even, but he, he knew clear, that his life would be simpler if Hitler declared war. You know, once he says, you know, the rattlesnakes of the seas and we're yeah. going to... Which, which is one of the weirdest metaphors I, ever, the rattlesnake of the sea. He, but. he really, yeah. <laughs> oh, we had these, the, the one, one thing I would say about Franklin Roosevelt's metaphors, you know, the garden hose and uh, we got to go out there and clean up this riot so we can come back home. And mm -hmm. all, all of his little metaphors are designed to take something that is a hugely portentous potentially disastrous decision and make it seem like it's just like garden hoses and stuff and yeah, you know yeah. rattlesnakes that you have to step on and stuff it was really quite a quite a uh, he was very good at what he did he was good at what he did no question um i'm right, sorry what about i didn't really taiwan, answer the question right, taiwan, yeah, right. taiwan well you know the the reaction to the balloon seems to me to indicate that we are at a high degree of tension and borderline hysteria in the United States. And this is what Americans do, by the way. We go from indifference to panic it, without stopping in between. Right. And we are now in relative panic mode when it comes to China. And honestly, I hope Xi Jinping is paying attention because um, if you go back and look at the mis the way Japan wound up in conflict with the United States. It was definitely a two, a, a, a dance for two. It wasn't just the Japanese got up one morning and said, hey, I think we'll go hit the United States. It was a consequence of per correctly perceiving that the United States was opposed to what they were doing, wanted to limit what they were doing, and was ultimately prepared potentially to strangle them economically to prevent them from doing, and Japan was 100% dependent on the United States for everything in that period. Right. Um, not in much, not the way China has much greater independence. Right. Um, and the Japanese ultimately got to a point where they sort of knew that they were not going to win, probably, a war. I mean, Yamamoto says to them, yeah. I'll run wild for six months, but after that, because they knew about the productive capacity of the United States. And in 1939, Roosevelt had already launched a massive naval buildup, which was going to come into effect basically beginning in 1942 and, and then for the rest of the war. So on the one hand, the Japanese knew that they probably couldn't outperform the United States over time. They were hoping against hope that if they smacked us in the nose, uh, that the American response would be, OK, we don't want to play. And we'll just pull out. You do what you need to do. Right. But I think at the end of the day, they thought there was a reasonable Which chance is, that that was not going to happen. And, and ultimately, Hirohito says, sometimes you just have to take, a, he used whatever, the Japanese thing about lo jumping from the platform of some shrine. But anyway, it was a, it's a way of saying, sometimes you've got to hold your, close your eyes and take a leap and hope for the best. And it's striking to me how many of the country, the major powers that wound up at war with the United States got to that point. The Germans in World War I also, at the very end, when they were deciding to use, uh, um, and to turn back to unrestricted submarine warfare, said they knew this was an incredible gamble and that maybe that it would be the end of them. I fear that where we are with China right now is that even if Xi Jinping recognizes that maybe the United States is not going to go quietly into this good night as much as he might have thought, he's so far down the road to what he's trying to do the way the Japanese were so far down the road that turning back seemed unacceptable to them, for right. sure. The question is, can he hold where he is right now um, and avoid a conflict? Or has he already, in a way, decided 
that, as he says, great changes have occurred in the international system, by which he means the decline of the United States and the rise of China, and that this is his best opportunity, which he would be encouraged to do in the same way that the Japanese were by the fact that we are now gearing up to deal with him. Yeah. So the sooner he operate, acts, the better. I'm hoping that he, the Chinese who are very histor historically minded, can think of the Japanese uh, example, can think of the Germany in World War I, can think of Germany in World War II, and say, this whole overthrowing the American system hasn't worked very well right. for most people. You know, before Xi Jinping really tight cracked down, Americans, we used to be able to go to China and have really pretty frank conversations right. with our counterparts, scholars, uh, officials, and so on. And in those days, my impression was it was very widespread in China, this understanding that the countries that have launched themselves against the maritime system generally don't do well. Yeah. And it gets harder the deeper you get into it. Yeah. Um, and that was almost conventional wisdom in China. But whether they're still there, I don't know. And we, and we of course, have contributed to, the, to laying, I call this the America trap, because we yep. do it over and over yep. and over yep. again. We have succeeded in making it look like this is a moment of opportunity. That we are such fools, so divided, and, so and, internally. And we were slow, we've been slow to react to the threat to Taiwan because of we, all this you know, nonsense that we told ourselves with one China policy and everything. So, so we're slow, and I think you know, we're in a situation where, again, China can run wild for six months. It, they might be able to take Taiwan. I don't know that we have the capacity necessarily to stop them. But if I were the Chinese, then I would say, OK, but then what? Yep. Is, that, is that a prelude to really shifting the nature of the international system? Or is that the beginning of the end of your regime? Because history would when suggest the strangulation if, sets history, in, Right. If, if you're now taking on the United States plus all of its rich allies in Europe and in Asia, that's a much stronger position than the United States was in vis-a-vis -vis Nazi Germany and Japan back in 1941, when they had already conquered everything that we were, trying, we were now trying to prevent these guys from conquering. So we're in a much stronger position. But again, we, have a, we give off an odor of disorganization and decline and our, our, our buddy Neil Ferguson is saying we can't do anything. We need to cut a deal with the Russians, cut a deal with the Chinese. We don't have it anymore. And I think, you know, someday that's going to be true that we don't have it anymore. I just don't think it happens to be true right now. And one of the things that... I didn't think you were going to end up sounding like Aragorn here. <laughs> <laughs> today is not that day. <laughs> today is not that day. I mean, you know, the other thing, the other mistake we make, and I'll, I'll end on this, is... is uh, we look at Amer this America, this is peacetime America. This is not what wartime America looks like. Wartime America spends 8 to 10 percent of its GDP on defense. We spend, we're spending a little over, a little under 4 percent. Um, wartime America has rejiggered its in military industrial uh, platforms to be able to produce the stuff that we need. We haven't even invoked the Defense Production Act to increase the number of shells that we're producing. I mean, this is not wartime America, and the people of America are not a wartime American people. Right. If you look at, let's not kid ourselves. When Americans go to war, they are as brutal as anybody. In fact, in some respects, they can more. be more brutal because they're a democracy, in a way. Um, the anger and the passion that greeted, you know, Americans went from not wanting to be in the war in 1940 to wanting to kill everybody in 1942. And uh, so that's another thing that people just don't take into account. Exactly. Again, the, one of the great lessons of history is that people don't learn very much from history. But Bob, you continue to try, and I think we're all grateful for it. Well, thank you, Walter, as do you. <laughs>